Hi everybody, welcome to another ITD TWF arcade video. In this episode we'll see the repair of the second of the two missile attack game PCB have been sent to be serviced. Missile attack is a bootleg of Atari Missile Command that was made in Italy by U Games. If you haven't watched the previous repair video, I suggest you to pause this one and watch it first, since it contains information about the differences between the original PCB and this bootleg and some test hardware and firmware that I made to troubleshoot and test these boards. This board looks in better physical shape than the other one. At least I don't see any broken part. However, someone else already socketed and maybe substituted quite a few chips. This 74LS244 has been socketed and probably replaced. All the 4116 dynamic RAMs have been for sure substituted. In fact, these 4116 all have a 1982 or 1983 date code, but all the other original ICs of the boards have 1979 or 1980 date codes. These two ICs have been softened, but are probably original to this board. Here is another replaced IC. As I shown in the previous repair, I've checked all the electrolytic capacitors for good ESR. This time there were no bad ones. Before powering on any PCB, it's always a good idea to check all diode and transistor junctions with a multimeter. In this case I didn't find anything bad. The main fault on the previous game PCB was a short circuit caused by a diagonal scratch going over the actions traces. So I spent some time checking on all runs of tightly spaced traces for any scratch that might cause a similar problem. Here's one scratch by the way, but it's not deep enough to cause any short circuit. When dealing with old PCBs that have no solder mask, such an inspection can save much troubleshooting time. Then I'm going to apply some fresh tin over the power supply pads of the interface connector. This is always a good idea, since these ports full with all the TTL and, and MOS ICs need a few amperes on the 5V rail, so we want the power pads to be smooth and have a good low ohmic resistance to avoid them overheating. I have shown on other videos the full retaining process, but I thought it would be good to show a very quick variant when the pads are not in a too bad shape from the beginning. The clock signal looks good. However, the reset pin is pulsing as if the watchdog is kicking in continuously. And the screen shows a vertical bar pattern, which is interesting. So I installed a 6502 knob generator socket. One issue is an obvious when checking the CPU data bus, for example on this bus transceiver. This signal is actually good, the trace goes in the middle because the data pin is floating when reading from unconnected addresses. However, this one is clearly short to ground. 
we found some shorted CPU data bus pins, so I had to find in the schematics all the IC that are connected to this bus and identify the problematic one. In this image, we see, for example, UNP3 and UBC1 that are enabled when reading the program ROMs. With the oscilloscope, I was before looking at the shorted signal on pin 5 of UNP3, which is the data bit 1 on the CPU bus. Now I removed the knob generator and flipped the switch number 7 that enables the diagnostic. Here we see the high current on pin 5, so I will look at all the pins connected to data bit 1 to see where the high current is present. Here we have no current. and also nothing on this one. Nothing here. And nothing here. Okay, here we are. The high current goes to this IC. Now, the high current on UNP3 is to be expected because the diagnostic, of course, needs to read the program ROMs. The other IC is another 74LS244 in position NP89, and that was added on this bootleg to read one block of the deep switches that on the original game are read using the Poké IC, which is not present on this PCB. I want to see if this IC is being selected by checking pin 19, and it seems not selected at all, the probe doesn't blink. Since this IC is not selected but still gets high current on one output pin, I'm pretty sure it's bad, but to double check, I've just got pin 17 that's connected to D1. And sure enough, D1 is not stuck low anymore. So I've just cut away all pins of that bad IC and removed it from the PCB. I've then added a socket and put a new spare IC. Data bus 1 is not stuck low anymore. And we get a solid screen now. This means something is still wrong. So I'm going to check the remaining data bus pins. Now the probe finds a high current on pin 14 of UNP3. Pin 14 is connected to data bus 5, so again I have to check all other ICs connected to D5. Now this one is interesting because it pulses just once in a while. That's UP5, which is enabled only when reading from the CPU working RAM. The diagnostic code probably reads some RAM location, then crashes, and it's restarted by the watchdog. If UP5 was bad, I think I'd see continuous current on the pin and not just once in a while, when it's probably conflicting with the real bad IC. The newly replaced IC shows nothing bad, of course. And another IC to be tested is UN5, which is also driving the D5 line when selected. But the probe shows no high current on it. Instead, here we have a continuous high current indication. However, this IC is also being continuously read by the diagnostic code. This is UM9 that's used to read the game control switches, so now I need a way to decide if UM9 pin is defective or UMP31 is, because both are continuously addressed by the diagnostic code. 
Luckily, during the previous repair, I wrote a simple diagnostic code to help me identify a dynamic RAM problem. So I remembered that my code doesn't read the input through UM9 buffer, but just reads the wrong code and of course the RAM, and we already can exclude a fault in the RAM data bus transceiver. So I have replaced the boot EEPROM with my diagnostic e -square PROM. Now UM9 is never selected. But we still see high current on the pin connected to the defined line. Again, I've just cut the shorted pin. The probe now shows the data bus signal on the trace that was connected to pin 7 and just high lever on the cut pin. And the built-in diagnostic now starts fine, of course I've replaced the original EEPROM. Then even this IC has been substituted with a spare one after installing a socket. It is now time to test the game controls. First of all, I'm checking the trackball inputs. You'll find a description of how I made a little gadget to test the trackball encoder inputs in the previous repair video. And there are no problems here, since the cursor can move in all directions. And last, I test all button inputs by simply grounding each of the appropriate connector pin. Every successful button input will change the diagnostic screen color. Also in this case there were no problems. So all I had to do to repair this board was to find two bad Motorola 74LS244 ICs, both with the same batch code QQ8024. Another LS244 was substituted in a previous repair attempt, so who knows if it was a particularly bad batch. In my experience, however, Motorola TTL ICs have always been very reliable. I hope this was an interesting repair and that you learned something. If you have any question, please use the comment section below. That's all for now. Have a nice time and thank you for watching.